Okay, here we go. All right, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, great to have you. I want to say congratulations to all of you for uh, going through a more in-depth, I wouldn't say it's deep diving, but it's medium diving into the scripture. You know, my, my favorite is deep diving, and then next to that is medium diving, which is what we're doing. And uh, and then uh, what I least like is just skimming through scripture because there's just so much there. And obviously you you've gotten a taste of that in this class, seeing how how even with a limited amount of we're able to cover a lot of ground, and um, there's so much there, and yet there's so much more that we don't even have time to cover, but. Um, Hebrews 12 and 13, the final chapters, and then we're going to summarize uh, the book, and I'd love to get your feedback, final thoughts of what you learned out of the book of Hebrews, what you got out of it, how it impacted you, uh, and how it maybe uh, um, strengthened or challenged you. Uh, love to just hear your feedback on it. So um, Hebrews chapter 12 and 13, so we we jump on in. Um, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Uh, you know, what a powerful beginning of a chapter. And of course, this is rolling, and, and I'm sure everybody knows, but reminding you that, that you know, there were no chapters and there were no verses in the, in the, in the scriptures. Uh, so, for, for, so this is just rolling right off of the great Hebrews chapter 11 of the by faith and the examples. And he's, you know, it says, you know, we don't even have time to go through all these other heroes. And he goes down the list and just in an absolutely amazing chapter or pericope, you know, a set of teaching about faith and the faithful and what they were commended for, not their righteousness, not their perfection, not their their wisdom or their prowess or their self-discipline or sacrifice, they were commended for their faith, right? And then he kind of sums it all up, and this is the, the wrapping up of that whole discourse. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and there's a lot of discussion about, well, who is that great cloud of witnesses, you know, and what exactly does that mean? I think the the, the obvious solution or the obvious understanding would be, uh, or maybe I should say the first uh, probability would be that it's the people he just talked about, right? In chapter 11, he gave an incredible list of heroes of the faith. Um, that would be the, the, I would say, the first improbable uh, meaning of who is he talking about in the great cloud of witnesses. Um, others would argue that um, it's the people in the church that are seeing all this. Others would argue that um, if you look, if you understand from God's perspective, there is no time. Uh, we are all, God is outside of time. And when we die, we join him in being outside of time. I've, I've even heard some argue that we're the great cloud of witnesses. We're actually cheering ourselves on right now. Because when we join God, we'll be able to see everything at once. And so you may be one of the people cheering yourself on, you know, saying, come on, bro, come on, sister, hang in there. You know, just don't don't give up. Don't shrink back, um, which is a pretty cool thought, a um, little mind blowing there, but um, but certainly prob pro possible, certainly possible. Um, the, the word the word there is very important. The witness marturos or martus, which we're of course, we get the word martyr from um, because. Uh, you know, early early Christians were called witnesses. Uh, that's where the denominational group Jehovah's Witness gets their title from, uh, is because early Christians were called witnesses because they were the witnesses of the resurrection. They're the ones that saw Jesus rise from the dead. And so much of our faith, so much of our Christianity, 
believing, accepting, and understanding the power of the resurrection is pivotal to who we are and what we are. As Paul said, if we don't believe that, then we're all wasting our time. Um, this is key, is believing in the resurrection. So those that saw the resurrection were called the witnesses. And that title stuck because, um, you know, all disciples in one sense are a witness to the power of God, uh, how our lives change, how we're set free of addictions or of sins that that captured us. So we're all witnesses, but the witnesses were constantly being killed. And the, the so the martus, the martus always were martyrs. They were dying. And so, it, of course, that became synonymous with dying for your beliefs. Um, and he says, because we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, because we have so many cheering us forward, let us throw off everything that hinders, you know, and, and this is, you know, as, as I've shared before, I'm, I'm very involved in spiritual formation and spirituality. That's what I'm getting my doctorate in. And a lot of that in the spiritual disciplines are, are to help us to contemplate, to, to be aware, to be aware of what God is doing, to be aware of how God is moving, but also to be aware of ourselves and what, what, uh, what, in, in, in which ways we connect to God, what things hinder us from God. And that's basically what he's saying is throw off everything that hinders. Well, you have to be aware, what hinders me? You know, is it my schedule? Is it my habit of saying yes to every time somebody asks me to do something? Is it, is it my, you know, my too, too much time watching TV? Or is it listening to music that makes me work? What hinders me? You know, is it my temper? Is it my sin? And and that takes time to be aware, to be conscious of this and, and be able to throw that off. And of course, I'm sure all of you have heard sermons talk about, you know, how in training uh, athletes would wear weights. And, and then when they, on the actual race, they take the weights off so that they're not hindered, right? My son who played soccer used to wear a, a, a weight vest that was like 40 pounds and he would go running with that vest on and that would strengthen his legs and strengthen his body. Well, in the race, and we're all in the race, right? And he talks about that. You, th you take that off, right? And the sin that so easily tang entangles us. So it's a very practical, very powerful uh, illustration of making sure that we are setting ourselves up to win. And he says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And in the classic line, fixing your eyes on Jesus, which we've already been admonished or exhorted to do that, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to set our hearts on, on God, and to keep doing that. And, you know, I, I've, I've, um, I've had the, the blessing to be in several turnarounds of churches and ministries, you know, in, in New Jersey and San Diego and, and with Hope Worldwide. And we're in the middle of a turnaround right here in, in, in L.A., in Metro L.A., um, and always I found the key is getting everybody to fix their eyes on Jesus. That's the key. That is the most important thing is that people get their focus on Jesus, they, that they are become aware of God in their lives and aware of the Holy Spirit moving, and they get their eyes fixed on Jesus. And that was a pivotal point in, in the San Diego church when we made our theme Jesus, that for the year our theme was Jesus. That's pivotal here in Metro as we have in the Metro ministry here that we have had our theme eyes on Jesus, our theme uh, uh, focused on God, our theme in him was the theme and the theme now encouraged by the spirit. But what our focus is and what we think about, what we what we read about, what we listen to about, what we watch about all affects us way more than we think oftentimes. And we, we there's there's a whole world going on outside of our awareness. And that's why spiritual formation is so important is because it's learning to be aware of what's happening around you, how God is moving, how things affect you, what is making you stronger, what is making you weaker. Um, and that's basically what he's calling us to, is a focus on Jesus, who is 
the pioneer or the Greek word archagos, the 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 first the trailblazer. You know, it's it's a good way to put it. Uh, the and the perfecter, the Greek word teleos. I forgot to write that in there, but which we've already talked about in the previous classes. You know, perfection not meaning flawless, but meaning fully mature. He fully developed faith, living by faith, and so because he has walked this path, we can fix our eyes on him and walk the path as well. And that's what the admonition is here. That's what the exhortation is. Just follow Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. He's already walked this trail. You don't have to blaze the trail. He's the trailblazer. You just need to walk the trail. You need to follow the path of live the way he did, do the things he did, um, and and do them the way he did them. And he was the perfecter of faith, the one who developed faith, the one who matured faith. And we can do the same. That's part of the reason why it's so important to, to always be reading the Gospels. Always, like just always. I mean, this is something that we should be constantly doing. I have my daily routine, which includes reading books, which includes prayer, which includes meditation, contemplation, but always also includes reading something out of the Gospels, you know, and just keep reading because they keep Jesus in front of me at all times. And he says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Right. So we've talked a lot about Jesus's role and in, in him sitting at the right hand of God, at the throne of God, which, of course, is a huge deal, and I'm not going to go into it because we've already talked about it, but but he says, and he's painting a picture, reminding us, right, who is Jesus? He, he, he He's the one that endured, he's the one, you know, and as we follow him, there isn't anything that we're going through that he hasn't gone through already, and endured it, and overcame it, and far worse, having been crucified, right? None of us have been crucified. None of us have bled the way he bled, right? Scorning its shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, right? Like we just, we think about Jesus. This is why communion is so important. It's not just a tradition. It's the time to stop and consider Jesus dying on the cross, what he did, the shame of it, the power of it, the victory of it, the great, I mean, there's just so much there, you know, and that, that, that communion time is really important when in early Christians, if somebody wasn't, was sick or not able to, somebody would take them communion. That's how important it was that we regularly commune with God, that we regularly eat that bread and drink that a cup so that we remember Jesus and the cross and we continue to proclaim him. And he says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, right? Consider, it's a very important word to, to contemplate, to think about, to meditate on it. To, this is what we need to think about, right? And how he endured this and how he overcame this so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. And I think that this is this is a huge challenge. The, old, the longer anyone has been around in the church, the longer as anybody's been a Christian, it's very easy to grow weary and to lose heart. And that's, again, why I think the book of Hebrews is so incredibly important. Because, you know, the Hebrew, as I said at the very beginning, it was written to Christians who are probably around 30 plus years old. That's most of our fellowship now. <laughs> That are that that hit that mid stage, you know. In any race, it's the middle of the race that's the hardest. You know, the beginning is exciting and the end is exciting, but the middle is where people wear out, you know, and and where honestly many disciples can lose heart and fall away. And if you've been around more than fifteen minutes in the kingdom, you've seen that happen too much, right? Um, so now I spent a lot of time on the intro just because this is this kind of sets up everything. I'm not going to be able to do that with the whole chapter, but but gosh, there's so much there, right? There's so much there. And and he goes and he starts heading into the discipline of the Lord. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Okay? So he's 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 saying, "Okay, you know, you're thinking about 
the blood that Jesus shed, he shed his blood. He literally shed his blood. Now think about this. You you have not shed your blood yet. And so this is probably before the worst persecutions broke out because we know that it things did get to a point where many Christians were shedding their blood um, and losing their lives. Um, but but you know, he makes the point here, like and I know it's hard, I know it's difficult, but reminding us that it was more difficult for Jesus and what Jesus went through was far greater than what we have to go through. And, and he says, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? And he shifts a little bit in the theme here to the discipline of the Lord, right? He says, and, he, and, he, and he's quoting Proverbs 3, the Septuagint, and I've pointed that out before that, that um, the book of Hebrews quotes the Septuagint a lot because that is the copy of that is the version of the Bible that the, the the diaspora, the Jews that were scattered around the world used. So that absolutely points to the audience. If he was writing to the church in Jerusalem, I don't think he would have used the Septuagint. That's the Greek version of the Bible of the Old Testament. He would have used the Hebrew version. That's why if you ever notice sometimes when you see a reference in your New Testament Bible and you go back and look it up in the Old Testament, it's different. And you're like, wait, why is it different? Well, because our Old Testament is a translation of the Hebrew scriptures. They were using the Greek scriptures. So anytime you translate something, there is some change. It's not, it shouldn't be a significant change, but there is change, you know? And 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 so even this use, you know, I've commented on before, but it shows you a little bit that that God's okay with translations. When I was a young Christian. There was a huge pushback in the Churches of Christ of using the NIV. Everybody was still using the King James. And people said the King James Bible is God's scriptures, you know, and you can't use the NIV because that's a translation. And people didn't realize, no, God did not give us the King James Bible. <laughs> but, and, and that's actually only about 400 years old anyways, you know, for so the, the, the original scriptures were in Greek and Hebrew. And God did not make us use the original scripture. You know, the Muslims, they have to use the 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 the, the Quran in Arabic. They're not supposed to translate it. The Hebrew, the Jews read the Old Testament in Hebrew. In the synagogue, the custom was still used to use Hebrew. But God didn't hold us to that. He he, I mean, the, you know, here's a book written to the Hebrews, the Hebrew Christians, using the Greek scriptures which tells you something. God's not all worried about. I just literally just last week I had somebody asking me, you know, why don't we call Jesus Yeshua? You know, that's what, it's his name. We're supposed to use his name. And, and I've heard that argument before. And my answer was, well, because the Bible doesn't call him Yeshua. <laughs> and the New Testament calls him Yesu, Yesu which is Greek, Jesus. That's that's what the, the Bible calls him. The Bible did not call him Yeshua, even though that's what I'm sure his name was in Hebrew. So, so we, you know, people get caught up in that kind of stuff, but clearly God's not worried about it. It's it's the meaning behind it, the purpose behind it that's way more important. So he introduces this idea of discipline, you know, and, and he quotes Proverbs 3: My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. And there's a teaching here that you're going to go through hardships. It doesn't mean God has abandoned you or forgotten you, which was a real problem back then, is that if you suffered, God must be mad at you, or God must not love you or care about you, which is, of course, a very wrong teaching and a very wrong understanding of how God operates and who God is. It's still around today. People still, somebody dies, people get mad at God that he's he's being mean to me. He's he's not listening to me, doesn't care. Um, and he goes into an explanation of God as a loving father. He says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. What children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us as we and we respected them for it. 
so much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live. They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplined us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Okay, so he introduced the idea of, of making sure that we see God as a loving father, which is what Jesus spent a lot of time correcting was how people saw God. Many of his parables were, were to correct their theology. Bad theology makes bad religion, and bad religion is toxic to your soul and to the whole world. I mean, most of the, the, the angst and the anger against Christians in the world is because of hypocrisy, because of legalism, and because of self-righteousness which are the children of bad religion. <laughs> that's that's what bad religion produces. And we all have to watch for it. It's like the cancer of the soul. It can happen to any of us. Jesus warned us to watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. Um, so, so we always have to be careful of that. But, but understanding that God is a God of love, that's good religion. That is theologically sound. And that's what he's reminding us here. Of, of what Jesus so 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 thoroughly taught and showed and demonstrated to us that God is a God of love and and he's telling us look this father this God of love and 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 you know it's interesting to me that that he uses the father as a symbol of love for a person going through hard times because you know unfortunately in our world today most not most, I shouldn't say most, many people do not have a positive father figure in their life. Maybe most. So this is a difficult one for us. There are people that have a terrible father image in their life growing up. And, and clearly the world was different when this was written, that he could refer to a loving father as disciplining us. You know, we're not an abusive father, not a evil father, not an angry father, but a father who loves us. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be, right? So the discipline of the Lord, he gives us three reasons to accept it. Um, th those who came before us have fought the good fight. You know, he refers to the people that have gone through this already. Uh, our suffering is relatively minor compared to what Jesus endured. He talked about that, um, that discipline or hardship can be an expression of God's love. You know, that a father disciplines their child. Now, this, all of this is in the category of when God is disciplining us. Not all discipline is necessarily from God. Not all suffering, I should say, is not ne is necessarily from God. Here he's talking about suffering that God is allowing um, and and how we should think about it. And I think this is... This is really key, especially in today's world. You know, how do we look at hardships? You know, our world hates suffering. Our world hates going through any kind of pain. We have pills for everything, right? If we don't have a pill, then we've got a cream for it. You know, we hate suffering. We hate hardship. We hate doing without, you know, I mean, you know, I, I think <laughs> for most people in the world today, hardship is my, my Wi-Fi is slow, you know? Other people in other countries suffering is I don't get to eat today, you know, it's a big difference. And and so that has to be kept in mind in this. What kind of suffering are we talking about? But in general, our attitude towards the, the difficulties that God allows to come our way, um, some people can accept it with faithful resignation, which is a maturity, right? To surrender is what we would call it, right? Um Sometimes we can accept it and endure it as satanic, and there's no doubt that sometimes Satan really goes, he's, of course he goes after Christians, there's plenty of scriptures of that, that he targets us, he wants us to suffer. Um, uh, you, sometimes people can accept it, but with an attitude of woe is me, you know, kind of a, 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 a why am I the one, why why am I suffering, and not realizing how the, that the whole world is suffering in different ways. Um, accepting it as a cruel punishment, you know, that God is not loving, God is not care, God is against me. Um, we, I mean, I think all of us have moments like that. Some people get stuck in those moments. Um, 
some or or we can accept it as if it came from a loving father which is the exhortation here is that god allows you to go through things but he is watching over you and he is with you and if you understand that if you understand god's love with you and how he is with you then you can endure it then you can get through the difficulties and and that he's watching over you now I do think it's important to note, and and sometimes it 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 scares me. I hear Christians say things like, "I guess the Lord willed it." You know, somebody dies or somebody suffers, and we just assume that that's what was God's will, or that God must have uh, must have a plan in this, you know, or that God has His reasons. And and I think we've got to really be careful with those because. We don't know whether it was from God or whether it was from Satan. We do know that the ruler of this world is who? The devil, right? The scriptures teach that very clearly. This is why Jesus said to pray that God's will would be done. So not everything that's happening in our world, in fact, I would say most of what's happening in our world is not from God. It is not God's will. So be careful what we assign as God, you know, somebody dies from cancer. Well, I guess that was the will of the Lord. No, maybe not. Maybe they died of cancer because of all the toxins that are being put in our food because of all the greed to save money. And, and that, so it's really from sin. Sin killed that person. Now we think, oh, well, it was a disease. Yeah, but it, the disease was born in sin, you know, and, and, Maybe not that person's sin, maybe somebody else's. And there definitely is a connection between sin, doubt, and fear, and disease, and sickness. What connection is there? We don't know. It's definitely not the traditional connection of that. If you die of something, God must have been mad at you. No, that's not <laughs> That's not at all true. And Jesus took that apart as well. That, that even the people God thoroughly loves will die of things and tragedies and suffer. You know, I love somebody once asked um, C.S. Lewis, why do Christians get cancer? And his answer was so that we can show the world the difference. And I love that answer. I think that's a great answer and a great attitude to look at how we look at hardship and suffering. And sometimes it's just good for us. It prunes us. It, it, you know, I would have to confess that some of my best prayers are when I was in deepest pain. Some of the times I have felt the closest to God was when I was suffering the most. You know, so there's even in all things bad, God has a way of working and working powerfully. So so that's important to keep in mind. Um, so there and, and he gets he jumps to the exhortation here. Therefore, right? And as John said, whenever you see a therefore, find out what it's there for. Okay, because of God being a loving father, therefore strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed, right? So so he's. it's an exhortation. It's a, come on, guys. It's a parakaleo. It's like, do not stay weak. Get yourself strong. Get to being spiritually strong. I think this is this is where 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 it is important that we understand our part in this. We are saved by grace, not by ourselves. We are saved by faith, not of our deeds, right? But yet faith without deeds is dead. There's things that we must do. We must keep ourselves strong in the Lord. We must keep ourselves connected. I honestly, that's why I appreciate all of you who, who've, who've gone through all these classes, because what you're doing is you are feeding your soul. You're like the person that eats only organic and no meat, and you know that is, that is being really careful about what they eat to take care of their body. You're doing that with your soul right now by just carving out the time to sit in a class, to listen, to study, to learn, to grow. And obviously, this isn't the only way. This, there's many ways to do that. But you're doing something to make yourself strong in the Lord, to feed your soul, to strengthen the Spirit of God in you. And that's basically the exhortation here. 
is make sure you keep yourself strong and healthy spiritually. He says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy, right? This is this is the admonition, admonition. And 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 you know, I, I forgot to point it out, but basically 12 and 13 are just a series of smaller admonitions. We make we call it the fifth warning of Hebrews, but it's really a bunch of them. It's just like a pearl. Think of it as a pearl, a, 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 a string of pearls, just boom, 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 one right after the other. And he says, you know, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord, you know, and, and keeping in mind what is holy it means to be set apart, means, means to live different than everyone else. Our world right now is going crazy. Our world is imploding. Our world, it's ripping itself apart. Our world is just chaotic. Don't be like the world. Don't give in to the world. Don't follow the world. Don't think like the world. Don't see things like the world. Don't be like the world. Be holy. Be set apart. Be led by the Spirit. Be influenced by the Word of God. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. That's the argument he's making here. Don't give in to the world. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I mean, he's he's warning us here of, of this temptation that we all have to, to go back to the world or to be, uh, to try to save ourselves, right? So he says, don't see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. We live by the grace of God. Don't try to win your salvation. Don't try to don't try to be legalistic and get into heaven. Rely on God. Keep your eyes on Jesus, and and don't you know? So it's kind of don't be like the world. Don't be religious. Do not let whatever you do any bitter root grow up to cause trouble and defile many. I think that you know. I think this is incredibly important for the church today because there's so many issues that are challenging us. There's so many problems in the world that absolutely are affecting Christians, that affect us. And there's so much chatter out there about this and that, and and, and it's easy to become bitter. Now, it's okay to seek righteousness, to seek justice, to try to figure out our way through all this. But the way we're going to figure out everything is by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. That's the way. He is the way. I mean, that's his name. That's his title. That's his claim. I am the way. He is the way. And I think, especially right now, that many Christians, and I say Christians in the broad sense, not just disciples, but believers, are getting really lost on the path with all the political, uh, racial, social economic tensions that are out there and they're just getting lost you know they're getting lost in all the anger and angst and worry and and I'm not at all advocating that we don't deal with problems but we have to keep our eyes on Jesus that's the key and do not let a bitter root grow up in us but but keep the lord in mind you know as we suffer that god is a loving father and we have him to help us along the way. And 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 some despair and they give in to their sinful nature. So he says that. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to, to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. And obviously, the lesson with Esau is, is, is don't sell out. <laughs> don't sell out your inheritance. Don't give in to the pressure or the temptations of the world when you've already been running in the race, when you're already on the path, when you've had all your sins forgiven, right? This is that exhortation again, that warning and telling us, look, when Esau finally realized what he'd done and he begged for his blessing, it was too late. Don't be like that. Don't sell out your salvation, your place in heaven because of worldly problems, because of worldly issues. Don't get, don't, don't, don't sell your salvation. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world 
and let lose your soul. And I think some some Christians are losing their soul right now. They're so caught up in the world and in the problems of the world. And again, I'm not saying that we don't deal with things. We do need to deal with things. But always with our eyes fixed on Jesus, always from God's perspective. And and, and he said, you know, Esau with tears begged for his blessing, but he didn't get it. And of course, that absolutely hints to Jesus saying there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, he said that many will come from the east and west and take their place at the banquet, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown out. You know, and that that scripture to me is one of the scariest scriptures in the whole Bible because I'm a subject of the kingdom. You know, I don't want to be thrown out because I got caught up in worldly pursuits. You know, so that's that's that that's a very powerful exhortation. And he says, 18 to 21, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness. Okay, now he's he's giving us context, he's reminding us. You didn't come to a mountain that can be touched that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, or and the storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged with no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even the animal an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Okay, now he's really reaching all the way back to Exodus 19, you know, when, when the Hebrews came, when Moses led them to Mount Sinai. And uh, and it says, you know, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet, right? A, a loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. So he's referring to back when God established his people. But there's a clear connection that everybody sees between Exodus 19 and Acts chapter 2, when the church was started. In Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> it, this, it had many of the same elements. In Exodus 19, they were at the foot of Mount Sinai. Acts chapter 2, they're at Mount Sion. In Exodus 19, they, they, had pass, they, had, they had celebrated the Passover 40 days before, and that Moses went up the mountain for a week, came back down, and brought the word of God. Here, they had already celebrated the Passover. That's when Jesus died, right? He rose from the dead. Now it's 40 days later. He made many appearances. Now it's 40 days later. So total of about somewhere around 50 days later, they're celebrating the day of Pentecost or the Hebrew celebration of Shavuot when they received the word of God and the spirit of God. Well, that's how the church got started. And guess what? Same elements. And there was fire, there was loud noises, there was wind, there was all kinds of stuff happening. Um, there was fear and confusion. On that day, 3,000 people died when Br Moses brought the word of the Lord and they had sinned. On this day, 3,000 people were baptized and received life, right? Um, on that day, a new nation created, a new covenant was handed out, and a people that were formed for God. On this day, a new nation, a new covenant, and a new people of God. So he's clearly tying those together, reminding them that you, you are just like the people who came out of Egypt. Don't quit. Don't rebel. Don't back away from God. I mean, he's, he's saved you before. He will save you again. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly. So you're not, you didn't, you're not at Mount Sinai. You are that Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of righteousness made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, right? So he's He's reminding them that you're you're like the Hebrews, but this is way better, way better. I mean, this is angels singing and Jesus coming in the heavenly Jerusalem and, and reminding him of all of that. And so he says, see to it. And this see to it is, is one of those connecting phrases, much like um, therefore, but now it's a see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks if they did not escape 
when they refused him who warned them on earth. And here's that warning. I mean, we've heard this warning now 20 times in the book of Hebrews, right? Do not ignore God. Do not stop paying attention. This was really important to Jesus. This is what he was telling them. The parable of the sower was not spoken to non-Christians, to non-God's people. The parable of the sower was said to God's people. Make sure the word of the Lord is getting in you. It's growing roots. You're pulling out the rocks. It is growing and bearing fruit in your life. Make sure that. Don't be like the first soil, second soil, third soil. Be the fourth soil that the word got in like a seed. Roots planted, grew, bore fruit. And it's in that same chapter, Matthew 13, where he talks about they will be ever hearing, but never understanding, ever seeing, but never perceiving. They just won't get it. And that's what his warning is. Don't be one of them. He says, at that time, he shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The word once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And of course, he's talking about that we're part of not a kingdom that can be shaken, but the eternal kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is the this is the kingdom of God, the invisible church, not the visible church, the, the church of men and women who belong to God, right? That's what he's reminding us of. Therefore, since we are, and there's your therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. It's such, it's such a beautiful discourse that just wraps up in, 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 uh, in, in this, this picture of the kingdom of God, the mountain of the Lord, the kingdom of God. And, and then with the closing of, and remember, God is a consuming fire. It's like, whoa you know it's like it's at that point you drop the mic and everybody comes forward and you know confesses their sins and repents but what what a powerful powerful uh a discourse of reminding us what we're a part of we think oh that's just the church <laughs> that's just like my region that's just my sector no, this is the kingdom of God, the mountain of the Lord. This is the plan of God. And God is awesome. And God is a consuming fire. This is why perspective is so important. When somebody looks and sees a group of people that go to church, but another person looks and sees God's holy nation, the royal priesthood, because that's what we really are. And, 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 and the only way we'll be that is if we can be aware of that and remember that and keep that in our hearts and minds and be God's people. So that's, that's chapter 12. I mean, what an amazing, incredible chapter. And uh, I'm going to have to go a little faster through chapter 13. But, uh, you know, basic outline, beginning brotherly love of Hebrews hospitality, sympathy for those in trouble, marriage and sexual purity, Christian. It's almost like, like he's running out of space on the scroll. So he's just throwing everything in there. You know, I mean, everything is just boom, 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 boom. Uh, Christian contentment, respect for spiritual leaders and the mature, you know, I mean, all of it's just boom, 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 one right after the other. I, I do want to say a few things about the beginning and then we'll go through the end, uh, through the rest of the chapter rather fast and then close out. But um, you know, he says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters, okay? How we love each other is important. That not that not just, it's not a generic love. There's many kinds of loves. You, as you'd all know, there's four different kinds of ways of describing, um, you know, how, how we love each other, different words in Greek. But this love, phileos, brotherly love. It's a very specific love. It's a love where we're devoted to each other, not just to God, but to one another. Philadelphia, the brotherly love city, right? Philios is the brotherly or familial love, family love. How a brother and sister who love each other take care of one another. Then he says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, 
Some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it, right? Um, and uh, that you know that one that one's a, a fascinating study right there. Um, the word for hospitality is philoxenia. Philoxenia. That's the word there. That's translated to hospitality. Philoxenia literally means the love of foreigners or the love of strangers. Or another way of saying it is to love people who are different than us. One of the most remarkable things about the early church was how diverse it was. It was incredibly diverse, ethnically, language, uh, socially, uh, racially. It was it was probably the first diverse organization in the world, and and it, and of course we know that the biggest division was Jew and Gentile division right, for the earliest part of the church. That changed as time went on. There were many more Gentiles and Jews later on. But in the beginning, that was the big problem, was, was the tension between Jews and Gentiles who become Christians. But but specifically, the command is here, love those who are different from you, who are not the same as you. And, and, and he says, so by doing so, some have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Um, and of course, he's referring back to the classic scene when Abraham um, basically took in three strangers into his camp, fed them, clothed, or you know, gave them water, took care of them. He didn't know they were angels. You know, he, they were just strangers on the road, which was the custom. In fact, when you go into the custom was if you're a traveler and you're a foreigner, you go into the town square and you sit there. And you wait till somebody invites you to come to their house. That was the custom. In fact, we just a little bit later, we read Lot does that to two of the angels that went into to Sodom and sat in the town center. And Lot came and invited them to his house. That's 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 why the word hospitality is tied in there. But it's loving those who are different. How important of a message is that today with all the racial tensions, you know, to love those who are different. The opposite of philoxenia is xenophobia. Xenophobia is the fear of those who are different. And our world is sinking deep into xenophobia. And 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 you know, it's it's yeah, it's racial, it's also political, it's also social. It's I mean, people are dividing up into camps and demonizing each other. Even in the church, we struggle with this, you know, of getting mad at different brothers and sisters because they see things different or they come to different conclusions on disputable matters and and this really challenges that love those who are different that's the command here you know and and he says and you never know who you're loving and i've got some really cool angel stories i wish i could tell right now but i i can't right now i don't have the time but but you know you never know you know you never know and continue to remember those in prison and i will point out that these were christians in prison they were probably in prison because of their faith not because of their crimes you know i mean crimes against the state being that they were christians not that they were thieves or murderers or and that and and i'm still totally for prison ministries i think those are some of the most humble people in the world but but it's a little different people i've heard people misquote that say we should have a prison ministry yes we should have a prison ministry but not because of this scripture but because we love everyone um as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering and that again there's the there's the the call to love those who are different love those who are suffering love those who are suffering injustice love those who are hurting or angry and that's 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 where true christians people who really love god and have devoted themselves will rise above the divisions of the world because they'll love each other through it. They'll they'll overcome instead of just judging somebody by their anger, know that their anger must come from a hurt, must come from a pain, must come from a fear. There's something generating that anger. They they can look beyond the outside action to the heart and care about the person. This is Philippians 2. Consider others better than yourself. Look not only to your own interest, but the interest of others. And, be, and that's that's the power of Christianity in a world that is so divided and so full of hate. 
is is to really care about people at that depth. When someone you really love, like think of a parent or a child or a brother or sister that you have that you just love them deeply, even when they mess up, even when they clearly do something wrong, we're very patient and we try to help them to repent. We try to help them to get it right because we love them. We don't just judge them by their actions. We go, we we look deeper than their actions. That's how Jesus treated us. He did not treat us according to our sins. Even when we were enemies, he died for us. So that's, there's, there's some powerful things right there. I mean, they could do a whole sermon on that fact. If you're in Metro, you heard me do a whole sermon on just that paragraph. Um, he says, remember your leaders. I'm going to, I'm going to skip a little bit because we got to wrap up here, but in verse 7, he says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. You know, it, it, yeah. you know I, I think that this is, this is the beauty of spiritual leadership. It's spiritual leadership sets an example. And, and you can look at their life and you can follow them. And that's what the appeal was to hear to uh, by the author here was remember the people that have influenced. And it was, I'm guessing it was probably Paul influenced them, probably Apollos, maybe Aquila and Priscilla. Um, you know, these, these are the people who were influencing them, probably Timothy, you know, so they, they thought of their lives and they knew their example and how they were living it. He says, have, and then in verse 17, he says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Now I stick the word soul in there because that's in there in the Greek. I don't know why it really bothers me that they took the word soul out. Um, I wish they would have kept that in there because I think that's incredibly important. I think soul care is really important in the church. And and we largely ignore it. And part of it's because things like this. And and NIV decided to take the word soul out of there, even though it's in the Greek. In the Greek, it says they watch over your souls as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Now, you know, this is, this. honestly, these two are controversial scriptures because he's clearly saying, obey you, the leaders. And, and where people get challenged is, well, what if my leader isn't spiritual? What if my leader, you know, I don't agree with my leader, or I don't like my leader, or my leader's in sin? And here's the general principle I was advised is that, that pray for your leaders. This is why the Bible says pray for your leaders, whether it's the leader of the country or the leader of your church or the leader of your company, pray for them so that if they're wrong, that they'll see they're wrong and get right. Or if they're right and you're wrong, that you'll see they're right and you'll get it right. You know, that somebody needs to get it right, you know, and that, and also pray that you will trust God because I can tell you this, you know, I, okay, first of all, I'm just going to be honest here. We've all had some, seen some terrible leadership, you know, whether it's our church or whether it's our country or our, and whoever you think that is, that I'll leave that up to you. But we've all seen bad leadership and we know how damaging and hurtful it could be. And most of us want it dealt with immediately. We just want that person taken out. But God is patient. God is gracious. And, and trust me, he will deal with that leader. If that leader does not repent, God will take them out. I've been around the church now 40 years. I've seen some terrible leaders rise up in the church, and every one of them, God takes out. He gives them a lot of time to repent and to get it right. And if they don't, he takes them out, and he replaces them with spiritual leadership. So, it, I think it's why God never advocates rebellion. He just never does. He never advocates people rising up against the leadership, even 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 political stuff. He just now that doesn't mean you can't you shouldn't speak out against injustice. I'm not saying that. That doesn't mean you shouldn't stand up for what's right. I'm not saying that. The Bible says to do that. But but when we want to 
overthrow a leader, we've got to really be careful. I mean, there was a group of brothers that were asking advice for me. They wanted to overthrow their church leader. And I warned them. I just said, guys, just remember that God has never blessed a rebellion. Look up rebellion in the Bible. I mean, when when Aaron and Miriam, two pretty spiritual people, spoke out against Moses, God struck him with leprosy. You know, I mean, God just never chooses rebellion. Even David, a man after God's own heart, did not rebel. He was chased by Saul. Saul cornered him. But even when he cut that little piece of his, his robe, he apologized for it because he knew he was just being rebellious, you know, and, and even David handled it in an incredible way. So that's, I think that's a, that's a powerful statement for our day and age. And again, not saying that doesn't mean we don't speak out for in, against injustice or stand up for what's right. We are admonished to do that as well. And they just said that earlier. We talked about, you know, suffering and, and caring for those in prison and those who are suffering as well. So we finally reached the key scripture of the book in chapter 13, verse 22. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact, I've written to you quite briefly. Now, most people think that wasn't very brief. That's 13 chapters. <laughs> well, I'm sure he had a whole lot more to say that we didn't, that he didn't say or she didn't say. Um, but uh, I, I get the feeling the scroll was, was, was that he was down to the last few inches of the scroll. So he had to squeeze it in, you know, and, and he said, this is, and he calls it the word of exhortation, right? The parakaleos, uh, which is what we've talked about many, many times that that's, that's what the book of Hebrews is. It's the word of exhortation. Then he, and he makes this very personal comment. And I love this because the Bible really is, it's, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to us through people, very real people. This is a real personal comment. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. You know, he just throws a little note in there about Timothy, um, which kind of shows you, you know, why, why people thought Paul wrote Hebrews for so long, because clearly whoever wrote Hebrews was influenced by Paul. His, his use of rhetoric and the way he makes his arguments and his masterful uh, knowledge of the Old Testament, this is a very Paul-like person and very influenced by Paul. And then the fact that he has a personal friendship with Timothy points to he probably was one of Paul's guys. He was probably one of Paul's entourages for many years, clearly influenced. He says, greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings, you know. And that's, I love that little, it's another little personal line out there, kind of like a letter, very similar to an epistle. Um, he says, you know, those from Italy send you the greetings. It's the promise of telling us who it is, but it isn't. You know, all we know is that there's Italians involved. We don't know if it's from Italians or to Italians, or there's a, there's a couple of Italians in the group. We don't know. We just know that Italians are involved in this. So if you're Italian, you can feel good about that. You got some kinfolk there. Um, so we wrap it up here with just kind of reminding us uh, where we came from. The five warnings, do not space out, pay attention. Do not slack off, make every effort. Do not stall out, move on to maturity. Do not fall away, stay near God. Do not fall away. Do not give in to fear, various warnings and encouragements about how we should live our lives the themes, the five exhortations, pay attention, make every effort, move on to maturity, stay near God. Various exhortations to be faithful in our hearts, our minds, and our souls. To live by faith, to not let go of that faith. Hebrews, what an incredible gift from God. What an incredible, I mean, we get so much out of Hebrews, powerful Christology, you know, to, to, to really understand who Jesus is, both his humanity as a human, as a person, what he suffered, how he was perfected through suffering, how we should look at suffering, and his godliness, the fact that he is in essence God, that he is one with the Father, that he is the Lord of Lords. I mean, it, they're both just painted so powerfully in the book of Hebrews. The new covenant and how understanding that this is not a covenant 
of simply obedience to the law. This is a covenant of the heart of understanding God's love and loving God. A covenant of the heart is not just based on obedience. It's based on love and faith. It's based on love. Yes, obedience will be there. Yes, obedience must be there. But it's not based on obedience. And 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 this is part of spiritual development. In spiritual development, the earliest steps of spirituality are usually driven by fear. Fear of punishment, fear of condemnation, or shame. Embarrassment of what I've done wrong, embarrassment about my addictions, embarrassment of my sin. But as we spiritually develop, we move more and more towards love, being inspired by love, being inspired by truth, being inspired by God's grace and goodness. And that's part of growing up spiritually. You cannot, you should not be a Christian 30 years and still primarily motivated by fear. Paul said, Christ's love compels us. That's the new covenant. It's a covenant of love. It's important to grasp that. It's not just a new set of rules. It is a way of heart, is a way of mind, a way of soul, of being in love with God and living out that love. Very different than the first covenant, which was very much based on obedience and the law. Um, Jesus was the fulfillment of that law. Hermeneutical example, how do we look at the Old Testament? How do we treat the Old Testament? It's a great sermon outline, you know. I mean, there's a pattern here of scripture, uh, uh, warning, exhortation, encouragement. It's over and over, five times at least, really more, but traditionally five. Uh, the focus on Jesus, how that is the key to the Christian life. That is the key to church health. I went through several churches and 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 made a list of all their sermons because everybody's sermons are online. And I counted how many sermons were focused on Jesus. And unfortunately, it was about 13% of the sermons. And it really made me think, okay, what are we preaching? Because we're preaching good stuff. We're preaching faith. We're preaching love. We're preaching uh, obedience. We're preaching, you know, history, all these things. These are all good. But that can't be our focus. Our focus can't be the church. Our focus can't be obedience. Our focus must be Jesus. Those things come from that focus, but they are not the focus. And that's where I think we get ourselves in trouble when those things become the focus. When the church becomes the focus, that becomes hugely problematic. Or even when leaders, especially when leaders become the focus, that really causes problems. Um, how to deal with hardship and persecution. Inspiration, the importance and the value of inspiration, and how that's carried through faith and obedience and salvation. That that just, I mean, the book of Hebrews has some of the most inspiring scriptures in the whole Bible, definitely in the New Testament, or in the book of Hebrews. Also, some of the scariest, I should say, but so so some of the most inspiring, you know, and and of course, it is the logos paracletos, the the word of encouragement. So that's the end of the, the, the book of Hebrews. Uh, I would call that Hebrews in a nutshell, maybe a big nutshell, but um, it is a nutshell nonetheless. Let me, uh, let me uh, stop the, uh, the recording here, and then I would love to get your feedback, your thoughts, what you, 